I've been locked up for driving 120 through town. I've been shot at and cut with a knife, messing around with another man's wife. But other than that, we ain't nothing, just good old boys. Hey, good morning. Good morning to you. How are you? Good, good. Good. Why are you way over there? Well, I felt right, like I was getting a little best, too. I was getting a little too morning? close. Yeah, so, <sighs> Scott Tomko, Kendra Douglas, Scott Snow, Bobby Leister called a Wednesday today. Welcome in everybody. Big show. We're going to be joined really by Astros Hall of Famer Terry Poole at the bottom of the hour. We'll saw talk Bobby Leister yesterday. Astros. Bobby was at H E B. Bought the right side of the store. <laughs> Everything. That's usually where I see him. It's either H E B. The, the Proteans. All the beef, chicken, fish, sushi. He was eating sushi on the way out of the store. And then had all the green stuff, all the all the salads and stuff. That's usually where I see him. Everything. Nothing from the frozen section. No, no. no and no, no, no hygiene-related items. Well, he's got lots of that. That was the last trip to AGB. Right. You stock up on one or the other there. And I just made all that up just to get y'all's brains yeah. going. There's Bobby, Lisa. There's Lisa Poole checking in with a heavier wallet Bobby this morning. Survived. Congrats for being a winner. Five hundred bucks. Oh, if you'd yeah. like to win a dream date with Lisa, be <laughs> our first caller today. Eight nine four forty twenty. You can win a dream date with Lisa. And she's Next got the money. Night. She's got the money. She she won five hundred bucks oh. last night. Wow. What is it? What? By the time they take out the taxes, was eight dollars and thirty-eight yeah, exactly. cents she took home. That's all she took. But home. the Catholic Church is very, very happy. <laughs> <laughs> they gave her eight bucks, slapped her on the knuckles with a ruler, and told her to go home. Johnny Houghton says, "Who says it's a good morning? October twenty-fifth and a snowfall warning." Well, you live in Manitoba, man. Hey, Johnny. There's no snowfall here. Patricia Nagel checking in. Tammy Keeling, David Glass, Marvin Mickish, John Paul Hull, Bobby Leister, Scott Snow. Jordan Glass, good morning, everybody. Glad you all could join us. Uh, let's check into, since it's since we know there's a snowfall warning in uh, southwestern Manitoba, let's check into the Wade and Carter weather and see what, uh, hey, what we've got. Let's do that. 74 degrees and partly cloudy in Victoria, Texas. 87 for the high today. A lot like yesterday. Big shout out to the folks at AT Durham Fee for all your farm and ranch needs, all your home needs, your Cow lick, your what are you, salt licks, all that stuff. All that stuff. They Mineral got tubs, it. all in ones, pour ons. Morons. They yeah, they got it all. Well, there's no morons there. You notice how one night at Palace Bingo kind of gives me that radio voice that I've never really had. I usually sound like I'm, you know, something's not right. Lisa Poole says, shh. Like, the IRS already took their share, so they're not coming after you for $500 of unclaimed money on your income tax, Lisa. People are like, what's up with Carter's voice? He didn't have a radio yeah, voice. So. like, shut up, man. He had his esophagus <laughs> taken out in 78. <laughs> exactly. He used to smoke, okay? <laughs> Which I did not. Thanks, you, to men you, like, <laughs> thanks to men like Norm Burgess right there. If you he, did, you might have a radio voice. People like Norm Burgess who told us that doing stuff like that wasn't cool. No, I was the anomaly in radio. Was I was the one guy that didn't smoke. Everybody smoked, right? Yeah. When I was a kid, Bob Nance. Bob Nance, the, the radio K&AL, great, great sportscaster. Yep. And, um, you know, looking back, I, I mean, I remember being like, gee, I wonder why Bob Nance doesn't do something bigger than Victoria. <laughs> and at the same time, there was only like him and Brent Musburger. That was it. There was... There was yeah. nothing. There was no ESPN. There was no Fox Sports. There and you was know no Fox. He probably had opportunities after being the guy during Hurricane Carla. Right. I mean, he was. He was the man on the scene. He was. He was that guy. Famous before. guy. JP points out Brent needs a vacation from all his vacations to repair that voice. Starting tomorrow, JP. Starting tomorrow. That's that's what I'm going to do. T Lat, listen in, sweetheart. I think I'm going to tell her tomorrow morning. Pack a bag. We're leaving. Well, we're doing that on a jet plane. But I don't know. Do, do you know I when you're going to be back again? Okay, good. But um, who sang that song? Peter, Paul, and Mary? Mamas and Papas? Uh, something like that. I don't like know. One of those bands that all sounded the same. Joni the, Mitchell? <laughs> no, it wasn't Joni Mitchell. I am. Um, she might have covered I it. I think I'm going to go with Dawn and just not speak for like four days. There you go. Just drink. 
Yeah, that's it. Hydrate and lubricate the voice box. That'll work. That'll work. That's how you do it. You hear Dawn walking out of that Palace Bingo last night. She sounded like a tambourine. All those little <laughs> empty airline bottles of Tito's in her purse. Ching, 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 ching. <laughs> People are like, here comes Santa Claus. Here comes Santa Claus. Walking out of Palace Bingo. Like, man, Donnie. Yeah. Ching, 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 ching. She's smart, though. Leaves no trail. Leaves no little no, bottles in good. the trash can. She could have. Nobody would know. Yeah. So. Nobody cares. Palace Bingo, we're friends, Mead friends. Get out there, you can go anytime. And what's great is... They have an 11-30 game, They're too. playing play the $500 yeah. games, the $300 games. <coughs> Beast Moss says, where y'all going? I'm going to Cabo San Lucas, sunny, freshly bathed by God. Stuart Martin says, talk about a vacation for Dawn. That's why she needs the bottles. At Bingo. <laughs> Cabo San Lucas. John Paul Hull says, leaving on a jet plane, John Denver. I thought somebody else did that one, too. I don't know. Mm. You're, right. You're right, John Denver did say that one. You know uh, who else did that song, I think? Uh, is it possible? Honestly, is it possible Jimmy Buffett wrote that song? I don't know if he wrote it, but he probably did. He probably did sing it. I'm leaving on a jet plane, flying back with a load of cocaine. That would be Jimmy Buffett. No, it was John Denver that wrote it. Is that right? Yeah. David Dusseldorf was his name. Did you know that? Yeah, he wrote the song. His yeah. name was not John Denver. Oh. He, that's like oh, yeah, Dusseldorf ain't making it. You look like a Dusseldorf. I could be Freddie Austin. Yeah. Peter yeah. Paul and Mary sang it. You're right. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. Ah, enough of that. So do you think we're finally going to get a speaker? I, Mike I Johnson, the, the GOP vice chair, the re Johnson. representative from Louisiana, latest, the latest nominee in the fourth since McCarthy was uh, ousted three weeks ago. You know what's interesting and this is where the lie of the Democrats comes in. Well, if the government shuts down, things aren't going to happen. The House technically shut down and things, are, and things are still going on. That's the BS of the Democrats. The government will carry on. The world will carry on. I'm not... I want to know what... I know a good speaker... A productive speaker, of which, believe it or not, I think Nancy Pelosi was a productive speaker for her agenda. I know Newt Gingrich was widely regarded as a productive speaker, someone who actually took Congress's thoughts to the president, worked with the executive branch to make things happen, sometimes worked against the executive branch, used his popularity to put pressure on the president, but other than procedural issues, I'm not being flippant. How big a deal is it who's the Speaker of the House? Well, I, the Republican Party is clearly in disarray. Donald Trump still steers who the nominees are, and he's not even an elected official. He's doing it, in essence, from home. You know, he's being... Under house arrest. Under an house ankle arrest. Wander. Yeah. Well, Tom Emmer... Had won the earlier internal caucus vote, but then didn't really have enough support to proceed with the nomination. Well, so, Trump called a, him a rhino, and all yeah, of a sudden everybody said, "Harumph, harumph, yeah. harumph, harumph." So I'm sure I'm sure Johnson probably has the backing of Donald Trump. But 117 votes yesterday, um, Tom Emmert got, and that still wasn't enough. 128 in closed door balloting is what Johnson got to secure the nomination. So it'll be interesting to see if he gets all 217 needed. Already, the Democrats have said they're all going to vote and for we'll, your good buddy Hakeem Jeffries. Oh goodness, Hakeem Jeffries is such a clown show. When you follow Twitter like I do, Dawn for the news, you will see that Hakeem Jeffries is literally a rah-rah propaganda clown show for Joe Biden. I've never heard him mention his constituency ever. All he does is go, I'm 100% behind this president. He's doing great things. Broad, yeah. panaceic statements. I'm like, dude, you have time. And, and the truth is, he's probably not typing that. A staffer probably is and because he's off doing congressional things it is a weird dynamic i've been in the cannon building walked right down the hall to where 
Michael Cloud's office is on the right. And before you get there, right there on the left is the office of Hakeem Jeffries. He's just another guy in Congress. Yeah, except but he's, he's been, the minority leader. And he's a black guy. And he's from New York. So he's been elevated to some kind of iconic media darling status that I just don't see no. at all. Mark Kurtz has a good question. Didn't John Denver actually leave this world in a jet plane? Or in a plane? It was in, yeah. a, it was in a plane, yeah, yes. It, was. it, was it wasn't a jet plane. aircraft. Was and I think he had probably had a few too many gummies to land. I don't think it was an experimental, was it? I think it was. I think he was a very. Uh, I think he was a very accomplished pilot. Which is worse? I think musically, Denver's the bigger loss. But which is worse in the world of G? Did you really do that? John Denver going into the into the trees or the ocean, or Sonny Bono going into a tree on skis. That one's like, how does that happen? Did you snow ski much as a kid? I know you skated. Yeah, a little bit. Um, Let me tell you one. I, I didn't like the extreme cold. I'm not going to lie. I If it got below 10 degrees Celsius, I wasn't going anywhere. Unless I absolutely had to. Like, I can like take bar. you back to, you know, and those of you that, that grew, and ladies too, maybe, it's, maybe it was a car wreck, maybe it was a sports related issue, whatever. Have you had those moments in your life when everything really just slowed down? where yeah. you were in a, a state of slow motion. I can take you back to numerous times, Scott Tomko, I guarantee you can too, where you pitch a baseball and a guy hits it and it's coming right at you. And the next thing you know, pow, you caught it. And it was they say, oh, great reflexes. In that instance, before you catch it, I can recall seeing that baseball coming at me. And look, Ash, it's just turning like that and i can see the laces it's like my brain froze it and it's a good thing you did and i'm not exaggerating it was almost like the matrix where (laughs) i'm like you're like and you let that ball go by um i remember that and by the way a lot of people put a lot of wood on balls that i pitched so i had lots of opportunities for that but i can take you to a moment where i'm a very novice I'm a Texas snow skier. I'm not a snowboarder. I would still love to go. I was a serviceable, green, blue slope skier. I could ski the blues. I ne- I went on a couple of blacks to say that. You know, well, we skied the blacks yeah. this year, and I was scared to death. All I did was go, yeah. ha, ha, ha. Skied the North American. <laughs> Just trying yeah. to get down. No, that's, I'm, I'm the same know? way. I'm, but but on I the could, blues, if blues I could, like was all right. Now, I would rather, and and I'm snow- not exaggerating. And snowboarded. I would rather have a nice toddy. No poles and about an eighty yard wide green slope that goes for like six miles where I can just go yada yada. It's yada, the it's the yada. it's the Aspen Vale version of walking on the beach. Absolutely. Yep. And they're like if you hear you know, you say like on your right, on your right, you know, the people up the mountain have the responsibility not to hit you. That's the rule in skiing. Yeah. And you would hear people go, fat Texan, fat Texan, because they would just go right and I'm like, yada yada. Scott Tomko says that's how he'd felt in the batter's box before getting hit in the nads. Right. <laughs> you can see that thing coming in. Right. Stuart Martin wants to know, you were in the, asked, you were in the Matrix? B. Small says, yes, this show reminds yeah. him of stuff coming at him in slow motion. But I was, all of this around the barn business to tell you that I did have one of those moments, and, I, and B. Small can probably verify this too, you have those moments where you simply have to perform or get hurt, whether it's driving a vehicle Allen's Burger Service, 578 6300, if you don't pass the test. But it's like, ha, ha, you have to swerve the car, and you and the car essentially become one to avoid an accident. Yeah. I remember being with a group of buddies, all better skiers than me, and we were going down this slope, and they wanted to go over to this slope, and there was like a little pathway through the trees. Well, they went, so I just, with them. Well, then when I got in there, there were some like some little bumps and the bumps. Those were, are called moguls. Well, but they weren't really. Oh, well, yeah, okay. but they, you're going downhill still. Yeah. But the there were little dips in the. Uh, whoop de doos and, and I'm going over the top of them because my skis were longer than the valleys, right? And I I remember my brain, I'm used to turning, and, I, and I'm tall, right? You have to kind of like put your foot down to turn this way or put your left foot down to turn that way. And it was kind of like in that instant. I'm honestly going, honestly, 25 miles an hour. No helmet. Got my, you know, no helmet. Helmet's for sissies. 
I don't think a helmet would have seen I had Sonny shades Bono on. I had shades on, not goggles. And I remember it being like, I had to be like the hip skier. Those plastic aviator looking ones that were red, white, and blue. Yeah. In the frames. Oh, nice. Yes. From Robert Redford. And they had to be like, and I had to do like some pilot stuff, Mav. And boom, 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 boom. And I came out on the other side and immediately went and stopped. And my buddies were like, come on. I'm like, I'll catch you. I'll catch you. And I had to kind of like dump some gras dew out of my bibs. <laughs> it happens. Man. But it was it was like a, yeah, I can do I that. I can do that. And, and I didn't ever do it again. Yep. I'm yeah. a very, um, ri- I'm not a risk, I'm a risk taker, but it's always calculated. Absolutely. I am a consequences driven individual. My biggest risk is probably, I'll get on, I'll get on a roller coaster, no problem. You know, you get on a roller coaster nowadays. There's one at, at um, Fiesta, Texas. Or they call it the Shark or the Jaws. Or you you hang suspended. Yeah. And so when when you get there, they tell you take your shoes off. You know because you're and there, there's a huge pile of shoes there, and you're in and they drop the things over you and your legs are dangling. You're you know, <coughs> well, it just starts off. It's so powerful that. And almost immediately, you go into an inverted deal. You can talk to the people. Well, I just—I was having a conversation with you, and uh, it's intimidating. I—you like roller coasters? I do. I don't like that stuff. Yeah, no. I wake. Good morning, hockey. Half a minute before we take our first break. Uh, Flamesers last night. It was a Rangers Flames game. Flames got out to a one nothing lead at home, and then proceeded to lose three to one. That was a hockey five seconds. That's all it was. You're worth trying to save Flames- that up. The Flames played like crap. Well, I need to buy some time maybe later on when, when there's actually something to talk about. There you go. Folks, the VCS companies for all your communication needs, when you need to talk about something, reach out to the Hartman Communication Empire. They're on Kerr Boulevard just inside the loop off of Main Street. For everything you need, you can go by and get a new Cube, an AT&T, the only locally owned and authorized AT&T retailer, and get a U. A uh, AT and T cord for your phone. Yep, whatever you need, the VCS companies have it covered in spades. You may want a ranch radio. You may want a fleet of radios. You may want body cam for your people. You may want GPS units for your vehicles that video where your drivers are. You may want to make a film studio in your bedroom. They can do it all at the VCS companies. Chesnick Furniture Company can outfit that bedroom studio. There you go. 116 West 1 Lynn. Pop on by. Talk to Bobby Leon and uh, the gang down there, and they can make your dreams happen. Can you imagine Furniture if you lives. walked in and Bobby Leon was trying to show you some bedroom <laughs> furniture, and you said, well, I've got a very bespoke plan in mind. <laughs> Where would I put the handcuffs on this headboard? And Bobby would be like, I, I don't know anything about that. Where does the pole go? Right, Chesnick Furniture Company. 116 West Waterland, and then Veracruz. Today is Caldo Wednesday, so get in there today because you can't get Caldo till next Wednesday. Simply the best Mexican food in town. Absolutely. You got a friend and want Caldo? It's not cold enough. Fine. They've got like Take eight. Take it home and freeze it. Eight or nine eat lunch it. specials under 10 bucks. Eat it cold. Can't go wrong. Eat it, it, is eat it lukewarm. It is good. It is good. B. Small says Carter's on speed this morning. No, no, I'm just very yep. excited to be here. I love you guys, and, and it's a it's a great time to be here. So listen, very, listen. Yeah. Before you do that, okay? Because I'm going to exercise. By golly, I'm gone Thursday and Friday, and no, I want no, no. I want some input. Hats off to the Texas Rangers now facing the Arizona Diamondbacks. The D-backs won four to two last night. I I did not see that coming, and and they were talking about Schwarber and Harper being like one for eleven. I didn't think after a 2 nothing lead by the Phillies that it was possible for the Diamondbacks to come yeah. back and win four the next. And so last year, the Astros beat the Phillies in the World Series, correct? Yes. So realize, realize that that's where we are. I mean, the Astros go to game seven again, don't quite make it. The Phillies go to game seven again, don't quite make it. If you asked me today to handicap the likelihood of one of those two teams, whether it be the Phillies or the Astros, going back to the their respective championship series next year, the Astros would by far be the favorite to me 
to go back to their championship series than the Phillies. Yeah. Phillies, volatile group, talented group. Love to have Bryce Harper. Well, what the problem with 20, the, like the, Juan Soto. The, seems like he's been there 20 years. The problem with the Phillies is they're stuck behind the Braves in the, in the National League East. And the Braves are by far the dominant team in that division. And if somebody, I mean, and if, if so, and they were, there was what, a, a 14 game difference between the Braves and the Phillies this year? So, so what, what do you say to people know. who claim, well, the Orioles and the Phillies were the, are the Orioles and the Braves were the two best teams in baseball this year? There's a lot of people yeah, that feel the that regular way. season. You know, neener, 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 if you're a Rangers fan. Well, and here's the thing I mean, the Rangers. You know, you could argue. Well, both these teams, the only reason they're there is because they were wild card teams. Yep. They didn't win divisions. But I would love to see the Rangers win this series. And I'm going to stop short of saying, oh, the Rangers should sweep. I don't want to be that guy that puts the jinx on them. B. Small says, two dome stadiums in the fall classic. I need to see some weather involved. Bah humbug. I agree. But I I will tell you that if I remember correctly, I think there was like sleet in some games in New York back when I was a kid. Yeah. I want to see the Rangers win for the state of Texas and for the Rangers program. The Rangers being the only team in Major League Baseball that didn't have a pride event at their new stadium. I was proud of them. Well, there were enough of them going on around the Yankee Stadium. They didn't need one in the Yankee Stadium. Right. No, I thought the Rangers were the only oh, team. Oh, the Rangers, that yeah. That. That's right. But Frank, I'll be- Frank Mejia, Yanks 2024. Yeah, not oh, going to happen. Frankie. Mark Angel checking in, Glenn Merrick, Steve Kidder, Michelle Wilson-Hawkins. I'd like to see the Rangers win because then we could also claim, honestly, AL West superiority in baseball over eight of the last, you know. And AL superiority. And then you start baseball. reaching back and you pick up those really, really good Ranger teams in 2010, 2011. And you Back-to-back start, World Series that they couldn't win? That's okay. You yeah. know, right? you got to get there to flounder. People ask me all the time, well, oh, Oklahoma gets to the college playoff, and then they get beat. I go, gosh, I wish we could get there. Yeah. You know, give me a shot at that. That's exactly it. you got to get there to lose. And I'm like, man, and you, you don't think these guys are tired? I mean, I know if you're a professional athlete, you should be pumped up. You don't need to be motivated to play in the World Series, but you don't think these guys are tired after 180 games? I wish I wish some of the Astros would have looked a little more motivated. In the but I will tell you this. I will. The only criticism I'll give you is this. In the event the Rangers don't win, part of it to me is going to be attributable to they celebrated early in the division and they had to end up playing that whole extra series because they should have taken care of business back then beating the Astros back then, been focused on the prize, and then skated into the World Series, which I think they would have done. I do think they would have done that. Instead, they had to go beat the team with the second-best record in all of uh, they had to go the, the American League. They had to beat, beat the, Tampa. The Rays, yeah. and that took something out of their staff. And, and so I'll be curious, but I do think the Rangers are the better ball club. I do, too. Absolutely, and they were, they were six wins better than the Diamondbacks in the regular season. Yeah. Well, and I keep going back to the last three games that we played the Diamondbacks. We just slapped them around. Yeah. So At we, home, too, right? Or was it and, out there? I think it was out there. Yeah. Swept uh, them, if I'm not mistaken. We're so. going to ask Terry Poole a couple of things. Number yeah. one, who he thinks the next manager of the Astros is going to be. Number two, what he thinks of the moves that need to happen, like, the retirement of Brantley, the Dana Brown will be busy, busy, busy this offseason. Yeah. Where's the money going to come from? Some... Have they hit TB up for some cash? Maybe Jim Crane says, "Hey, you're in the Hall of Fame now. You're yeah. part of us. Give me five hundred thousand for these guys." Look at the propaganda going on in CNN. Well, it's a humanitarian humanitarian effort. crisis now in uh, in the Middle East, right? In in Gaza. Then they show a picture of kids. Now listen to this. Listen for every to kid in that picture, yeah. I can find you a kid holding an AK yeah. and a grenade. Children receive food in the southern Gaza Strip, and there's a picture of that because that's what plays on people's emotions, right? I think that guy's wearing a Tommy Hilfiger yeah. shirt, too. Yeah, it's probably not, circa 19. Yeah. Wow, and then the Reebok over here. Nobody's wearing a Reebok there's shirt. there's that kid in the Astros years. World Series shirt. <laughs> yeah. 24. As the humani- this is straight out of CNN. As the humanitarian crisis in the Middle East deepens, the main U.N. agency working in Gaza said it will be forced to halt its operations later today due to a lack of fuel. Doctors in overwhelmed hospitals are on the brink of shutting down and said that they um, 
The waves of new patients injured daily and babies relying on oxygen supplies will die if fuel is not brought in. Just eight out of the 20 aid trucks scheduled to cross into Gaza yesterday made it. No reason as to why the other 12. So obviously the roads aren't the problem anymore. If eight can get through, how can 12 not get through? 12 others. Israel's leadership said a ground offensive is still on track. They vowed to wipe out Hamas, and they should. You know what? And here's the thing. The thing or the two things? Well, there's a few things here. Okay. We've still got a bunch of people kidnapped. The U.S. had 30 people die on October 7th in that attack, and there's been no response other than, well, we need restraint. We've got Americans being held hostage. We're, what, up to like 14 or so? No clue. Not doing anything. Negotiating with terrorists. That's what the Biden administration is doing. I, I heard Go back somewhere... Go for a second. Back to where here? I Go heard, to that article. Oh, I heard somewhere yesterday, real quick, if this was an attack on U.S. soil, it would be the equivalent of killing 38,000 Americans in one attack, given the population yeah. of Israel. And if, Like if Arkansas came at us? Yeah, more or less. So let me, let's just go back and look at how words matter, okay? As the humanitarian crisis, that's like saying when global warming didn't work, we just called it climate change. As the humanitarian crisis, is that what you call it? I call it the ass whipping in Gaza. That's what I call it. There's an ass whipping going on in Gaza, but it's a humanitarian crisis. That's CNN. How many how many times look, has Israel attacked? Hamas, unprovoked. None. None. The U.N. agency working Gaza says it will be forced to halt due to a lack of fuel by those terrible Jews who won't let us have fuel. Doctors are in overwhelmed hospitals on the brink of shutting down, and they have warned that waves of new patients, including babies, will die. If the fuel is not brought in, can you just try they don't have, to manipulate the yeah. language anymore to make those terrible, terrible Jews who simply said, wait a minute, you sent missiles into my apartment building in the middle of the night? We're fixing to whip your ass. And now they go over there and do it. Oh, the Jews are so mean spirited. They're not running through the streets lopping off kids' heads and raping women. Filming it for their parents to see. And sending it to them and setting people on fire and raping people. They're just over there killing terrorists. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry, little Ferdinand. If you happen to be a terrorist living in the Gaza Strip, if your daddy's a terrorist and his daddy's a terrorist and his granddaddy was a terrorist, then I don't have a big problem with the Jews eradicating you. It's genocide. No, it's not. It's not against a race. It's against a group. It's against a group of crazed terrorists. Think about this. There's been hundreds of billions that have gone in aid to the Palestinian, supposedly for the Palestinian people over the years, since 2005 and probably even before that. Where is it? They're on the Mediterranean. They could have seaports. They could have casinos. They could be a Morocco or a Monaco. Right. They could be a thriving country, but Hamas has taken all the money, built palaces in Qatar, live in five-star Ritz-Carlton's. Hosted World Cups. I'm sure there was some money that went to that from from Hamas to Qatar for the World Cup. Absolutely. My wonderful daughter, Kendall, checking in. Kendall, you're going to stay close. Keep listening, sweetheart, because we're about to have Astros Hall of Famer Terry Poole on with us, and we're going to talk about managerial changes in Houston. Um, And, Kendall, if you'd like to type right there, what's the number one thing you think the Astros need to do next year? We'll make sure that our listeners know it. By the way, if you you can't get to Atzenhofer, Atzenhofer Atzenhofer.com since 1926, Atzenhofer is... Simply a South Texas tradition, Chevy, Mazda, Mitsubishi. But if you want a new Cadillac, if you'd like a new Escalade, hook up with my daughter, Kendall. Give me a shout-out, and I'll get you all together. Here's Terry Poole giving us a call. Uh, listen to the other one. Listen tight, folks. Hey, good morning, Terry. Hey, good morning, Ash. How are you? I'm hello, well. how hello are you? Hall of Famer. How are you, my friend? 
Ah, Brent, I was hoping that you're going to be on. Thank you, sir. It's good to hear your voice. How are you? I'm uh, I'm doing okay. Yeah, have you um, have you? I know you well enough to know that you lived and died with those playoffs. Have you? <laughs> have you overcome it? Are you are you over it now? Moving forward. Well, I, I think we all do a lot of armchair managing in these games, and uh, you know we can poke holes all over this uh, Astro situation. <laughs> well, you know, baseball is such a uh, statistician's dream, and it's such a easy it's such an easy move to second guess. As you know, I can sit there. Of course, you've done it as a player, a fan. You've had it done as a manager. But you look back and you're like, Dawn is a really astute baseball aficionado. And, and uh, I joke about Dawn, but she gets the game. And uh, the other night when, and I know why Dusty did what he did. We're down four to two. And he went, he decided to go the route of, this is game six. He goes the route of Montero Stanek. Let's see what happens. You know, he, he gave him a chance with Maton. He gave him a chance with Neris. And then he said, look, we're down 4-2 in the sixth. I'm going to go ahead and go with with Montero and Stanek so that I've got Brown, France, Abreu for the next game. Well, didn't work out so well. When, when, when Montero was warming up, Dawn walked through the living room and goes, oh, Dusty, do you just want to just give him this game? Coach, is there any way we can package Rafael Montero with, you know, maybe a bag of sunflower seeds and get rid of that clown? Uh, you know, <laughs> you're being awfully tough on Montero. In a, 13 a million in free money. Nobody wants him. We're going to have to pay half his salary to get rid of him. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, I would just say this, that uh, you always be careful about, you know, uh, moving players uh, or especially pitchers that can that can touch a hundred miles an hour, and and you know I'm not sure. I think one thing should be established first here, and that is uh, what is uh, Dusty's official position right now? Is he moving on? Is he not? Or is this indefinite? What what is the official? Nothing right word? now. I think it's I think it's in limbo. I pointed out to Brent yesterday. I, I mean, I think you know. Okay, Montero had a bad start to the year, and he obviously didn't have a good finish to the year. Then he had a blip. But without him in August, we're probably not in the playoffs. Oh, Montero had a hopeless year this year. Yeah, <laughs> I, one, I, one good I, month. I just that, you know, that was. Uh, but then the year prior to that, he was outstanding. And yes, sir. It's funny how Naris pulled the same thing. In reverse, well, isn't Naris a, a breath of fresh air to watch on the bump? He gets so excited, and and um, I, I'm intrigued by, and I'd like to just going back to your day. I'm intrigued by the uh, extreme Latin influence on the on the uh, appearance of the game these days. The <laughs> the the, the uh, Adolis Garcias and the and the Hector Naris pounding and confronting players and oh well we used to be friends we you know rehabbed it together but the the latin influence is powerful right now with the emotion and i i like to see it i love it when we watch the world baseball and you've got venezuela playing the dominican and like they're like shanking each other at home plate it's great <laughs> stuff you see a guy bleeding on his way back to the dugout it's just fun to just watch a flesh wound it's a combination of wrestling and baseball yeah. dusty was asked oh. yesterday what's what's the future and he said we'll see so he i think he's done i do i think he, i think he's trying not to distract from the world series yeah. i think he's going to step away at the end any true to the fantasy that you might have a killer B management by pro, you know, by a uh, by committee, and have Bagwell, Biggio, and and let Berkman teach him how to hit. <laughs> what do you think? Uh, uh, I I would love. Uh, I think uh, you know if there is a manager's change here, I would love to see Craig Biggio get a, a crack at this. I think Craig has got so many you know positives. You know, he gives you an uh, image. He gives you uh, a love from the city of Houston. He's got, you know, he's done everything in his career that's been correct. You know, uh, uh, well, and, since, you know, since you straightened him game, out, he, since you straightened him out in the 80s. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's, a, he's been through tough times uh, with the Astros, and he's seen the glory days of the Astros. Too. I joked so with I think, Ash. 
I you know, said, I was in. I was impressed with him and Bagwell's ability to hold their poker face. Yes, sitting behind home plate that entire series, <laughs> and watching the, some of the approaches and hacks these guys took, and they didn't. They weren't as yeah. disgusted as the rest of us. I I have joked with Ash that if Bagwell goes out, you know Montero's on the mound. He gives up a jack. He's got, he's walked a couple of guys. And Bagwell goes out to talk to him on the mound, and before he says a word, he just jacks him in the jaw with a right. That's what Baggy would do. He would go out there and just, just jam him in the face and then go, give, give me the righty. Bring in the righty. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I, uh, before we move from the subject of Dusty, I, I think you got to give many kudos to Dusty for getting us through those early years that yes, we sir. got here with all that mess. Uh, I'm not sure there could have been too many other guys uh, in baseball that – that could have smoothed it out as much as it could be smoothed out. But he did a wonderful job. His team won a World Series under his management. Uh, you know, uh, this year, you know, sometimes you, when you make a decision, uh, things go wrong. You know, I, I remember myself managing at the college level that, uh, you know, one year I, I would try to always make a decision, make the toughest on the hitter when they came up. So I would make some, maybe a left-hander against them. You know, it's different in the college level. Nowadays, these are real professional hitters and they're not as affected uh, by those moves. But, but the, my last year, there were some, I, I did the same moves and uh, I went like, what, it would blow up in my face. And I went, well, geez, what, what, am, what am I doing differently than I did last year? And so, uh, and then, uh, but, and then sometimes your teams just move and play by themselves, kind of like when we get into the, we got into the playoffs, uh, Ash. Uh, all you got to do is just be there so that they don't uh, do something stupid. Yeah, just yeah. roll out the balls and let them play. Yeah, that's what you do. And uh, I think uh, they, that wasn't done this year as much as it was last year. Well, I don't know that it could have been done. And Brent pointed this out when we were talking about it uh, yesterday. I don't know that it could have been done as much this year as in past years because of all the injuries that the Astros had this year. I think Dusty, Brent said Dusty had to kind of manage this year for the first time. Yeah, I mean, I felt like Dusty yeah. Baker may have done, even though it doesn't hurt my feelings to say that I believe Dusty got outmanaged by Bochy in, the, in this series. I also feel like Dusty may have done his best job of managing this year just to get us to a Game 7. There was a lot of Band-Aid, a lot of duct tape holding this team together. You can make a good case for that, Brent. Absolutely. Yes, sir. But you got it. You do have to go back to something. You know, there's a couple of things. Valdez was one thing that did he go too long with Valdez? Just starting the guy, just starting him. He he was not an effective pitcher the last month of the season. Was Verlander yeah, maybe one two? If yeah. Verlander was available, why do you not put you know the second wow. coming on the mound? If I mean, if he's available, yeah. you know. No, I, uh, it, it, it didn't make sense. Uh, Tucker struggling what he did. Uh, and then the, the everybody, you have to address that Diaz situation. You know, there's a guy hit to, what, uh, 22 home runs, 21, yeah, in 22 like, home runs. In like 60 and, games. And, and got benched. Yeah. He, he literally got How do you expect a player to go out and provide a tough uh, at-bat in the playoffs when he hasn't seen a pitch in two and a half weeks. Or, well, let's you know, bounce into that. Are you content with this ball club if next year Martin Maldonado, Michael Brantley, and Chaz McCormick aren't on the 25-man roster? I think McCormick, if he's in an Astro uniform, definitely warrants to be on the roster. Good. Uh, you know, Brantley, uh, you know, that's another case. You, I mean, I can know. see him retiring. He hit 179 or something in the playoffs. And they, the reason he's there is that 298 lifetime average. Yeah, uh, it, it, there's, you know, that the case is, is uh, how much money do you want to put out? Because, you know, a player can only take a 20% cut. That's all he can do in salary. That's because uh, the old guys like you rigged the system. You ruined it for everybody else. <laughs> Why can't we pay a guy what he's worth? Is that the major well, league deal yeah, now? The, the, you can't Brent, lose more than twenty percent of your value in one year. If they want to resign you, there is a way around that, <laughs> and that is you release the guy. Nobody picks him up, but then you sign him for a lower fifty amount. bucks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like a baseball annuity. Not only are you a made man and you get your pension, but oh by the way, the most you can, <laughs> yeah, it's like a. 
current current value does not determine future value. But however, this is not a solicitation. You can still make eighty percent just by re upping. Yeah. What are we going to do with Kyle Tucker, Coach? I'm not convinced. Yeah. I'm not convinced we're not going to. I mean, honestly, I joked with Ash. It's not a joking matter, but it's baseball, you know, pertinent. I'm like, wh- I get the feeling like we're going to find out that. Tucker's going to walk in and go, by the way, I've got Lou Gehrig's disease. I mean, the guy has been so unaffected, so unemotional, nothing like the old guys we used to have roaming right field with passion. This guy, this guy looked like he didn't even want to be there. Now, I've always loved his nonchalant attitude. He never pats himself on the back. I think he's a tremendous team player. But this guy did nothing there was like never like a yeah in his game in the whole playoffs. Is he that worried about his contract? I, d- I don't think it is. I think he's he just simply went through a, one of his greatest struggles in the game. Uh, you know, if you remember Kyle when he first came up, he struggled like this then too. They had to send him back to AAA, and uh, so he got into another funk. And this is a case where. You gotta, you gotta put a little bit of this. I know the hitting and hitting instructors are working hard with these guys, but gosh, this is the time they make their money. This, you know, yes, sir. It's different. It's different in college than it is in pro. In pro, you can't allow a key player like that to go into a funk at a, at a wrong time. You just can't. That cannot be. And somebody has to be held responsible for that. Well, I've, I've yeah. been critical because the Astros have two designated hit, hitting coaches and they have another coach with a different title, but apparently is also responsible for some part of the hitting process. So you have yeah. three coaches on that staff all dedicated to hitting and the Astros couldn't hit a lick in the postseason once you got past about the fourth guy in the lineup. They need you, Terry Poole, to get over there and be a hitting coach. There's got to be a couple hundred grand for you over there. <laughs> you know, the, it, it's, Ash, you bring a, a really good point, you know, and that is when you got two, three guys in your head uh, right. telling you what to do, you uh, it's like a golf swing. You know, you can only have one thought. Terry you know, Poole. You, have one coach. you can only have one coach. And, Terry uh, Poole hitting guru. <laughs> hitting czar. We're going to make you Terry, the hitting czar. Maybe Butch Terry. Harmon should have been their hitting coach, and they might have actually had a little more success. <laughs> well, the yeah. guy that reminded me of one Terrence Poole was uh, Mr. Jordan Alvarez, who hit about 450 in the playoffs. And I was just like, yeah. that guy is such a gamer. I believe that we're truly watching – a future Hall of Famer just just develop in front of us. He's such a dangerous, really dangerous hit four power, hit four average hitter. And can run. And can run like a freight train. Yeah. You know, you don't see anybody if 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 uh the big man rounds, you know, he's going from first to second, they just give up on that double play because you're not gonna hit him in the face with the ball and he ain't getting down. So I well, I think you, Jordan he's a star. has turned into He's turned into the best Astro hitter ever, I think. Uh, and I think uh, El Tuve has turned into the best Astro player ever. And, uh, you know, and I that think that's fair. Because you got a Craig Biggio over there who's a dear friend of mine and, <laughs> and, and, and Jeff. And so there's a lot. I I think the, that the, what Jordan uh, brings to the play, but you, now you've got a, another issue is you got to protect that man. And you're not going to protect him with a Brayu. Yeah, I'm sorry, that's no. not happening because they are not going to pitch to him. He hits the way he does on pitches that are, you know, uh, an inch on the corner or an inch off the plate. Or on the ground, uh, and he yeah. just golfs them over the you right know, field wall. Well, that, that, you know. yeah. that brings up another question, though, Terry. I mean, Abreu took all year to kind of get going. He had a good playoff. But how much did the chemistry change with Yuli Gurriel moving on and – uh because the Astros didn't just didn't seem like they were having fun every game and in the dugout like they did in the past when Yuli was there. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point. There are those there are those players that bring that, uh, I guess, uh, you know, outside force into on a on a ball stuff. That's very much needed in uh, chemistry. However, uh, in defense of Abreu, we're not in the playoffs without Abreu's bat in, uh, in September. No, he, he really yeah. – I stood by him all year because I remembered yeah. that he's only two seasons away from a, from an MVP year. And I'm like yeah, – like One talking season about, away from, what, 36 home runs? Yeah. yeah, and I'm like, you know, th- yeah. it took him a while. What I was most flattered about is that I read that he was always the first guy to the ballpark 
that he was yeah. always out there taking fungo, working on his defense every day. And I yeah. think that's what allowed him to assimilate so well. When I, I love watching the interaction on the infield when Altuve would take a ball from Pena or Pena late in the game would you know reach above Altuve's head and catch a, a pop-up. And the looks they give each other and all that. And they almost immediately, early in the season, shared that emotion with Abreu. And I thought, okay, this guy has assimilated. Yeah. We couple, have a question for you. A couple so. questions from uh, listeners. Jonathan William wants to know, would Joe Espada be up for manager? I, I'm sure he's going to be in the mix, uh, you know, because uh, uh, more out of uh, respect and whatever. I don't know a lot about him, uh, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, he does know the players correct. Yes, he does. Um, but that's, that's an, I, to me, uh, there's a lot of people that know players on this team. And getting back to, just to, to Abreu uh, just uh, a little bit, he is one of the most likable people on that team. He, the, the team – Loves the guy. Good. And yeah. uh, you know, so there, he brings he brings that to the, you know, he's not poison. When, you know, like some guys come into a team and you can say, well, he better produce because, you know what, he's a piece of garbage otherwise. <laughs> right. Yeah. On the other side of the locker room talking behind the manager's back and other players, you know, we don't – he is not, he is really a salt of the earth type. Of guy. So there's a lesson out there, kids. If you're going to hit 220, be likable. <laughs> be a nice guy. That guy sucks. Oh, but he's a tremendous. He's a great clubhouse guy. He'll always get you a bud heavy after the game. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying in his defense, you know, I can poke holes in his swing all day long. You know, if you want to get to bring you out, throw a fastball up and in on him. He can't. Get yes, sir. Yeah. He never really extends. It's like he's like a like an old butcher or a, a blacksmith up there. <laughs> his swing is not fluid and beautiful. I I don't know what you do with that. So a question for you as a as a manager, and I, I've said this for years, and I want you to feel free to just shut me down. Say, Carter, that's just wrong. I'm a huge Biggio start, fan. Start now. No, I've always been a huge Craig Biggio <laughs> fan. But I've made the comment that there's never been a guy with 3,000 hits who was as easy and out as Craig Biggio. All you had to do with Craig is get ahead of him in the, in the count. Hard to do. Hit early in the count and was a great hitter. Get ahead of Craig in the count and throw him slider away and watch him flail. I watched that guy, especially late in his career, like just flick his wrist at balls that were out of the zone. They started out in the zone. It's like his eyesight was gone. It's a fastball, I think. And then it would cut across the plate, and he would go, wee. And I thought. Well, I, I, I will take this chance then, Brent. Yes, just, sir. Uh, Dispel. To, uh, to deny everything, you know, that what you just said. Good. I, 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 Completely on the opposite side of that. What do you know? I think. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Everybody's entitled to an opinion, but uh, you know, but yours people, is wrong. People, <laughs> people don't get three thousand hits because they don't know what they're doing. No, that's they true. Of course, he play played twenty nine seasons. No, I'm yeah. joking. I am totally joking. I no, love Craig I, Biggio. Yeah, that's but that's what it takes. And Craig has been nothing but the absolute great for that organization. And true. Now, I'm going to tell you one stat of Craig Biggio that you will just have. One year, he hit leadoff and did not hit into one double play all year long. Well, what does that say about him? What does that say about him? You know, that well, he, he runs. He had a lot he of runs doubles. Every heart. He was the best example that organization ever had about how to play the game right. And that, that was such an influence on all the players that, play, that he played with and the players that played after him. True and story. So, uh, yeah, I think I he's have a great one. Utmost respect for him, so please, Brent, uh, don't bring that up to me. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean that with love. And you know, being the consummate, being the consummate, uh, consummate Canadian, Terry goes, "Sorry, sorry, but you're wrong. I'm sorry, you're wrong. Sorry, Terry. We got to take a quick break. Hang on. And you we'll got time? Back. You got time to hang on? Yeah, yeah. I'm All right, in, great. Know, I'm in Houston traffic. Oh, oh yeah, great. you got plenty of time then. Yeah. <laughs> Palace right. Bingo last night. We're friends meeting friends. We had a great time. Lisa Poole yeah. won 500 bucks. Yep. Give her a call. She's looking to spend it with a friend. Reach out to Palace Bingo. Every Get night they're playing. Palace Bingo. Great time. Yeah. We talked about ads and offer. Great dealership. South Texas Traditions is 1926. Armor Air, 579-0966 for all your air conditioning and HVAC woes. They've got the solution, so make sure you give them a call to handle all of that for you. Chopping Block, Wacky Wing Week. 
We've got wings on sale, four ninety nine a pound. Can't beat that price. Absolutely. Let's get back to Terry Poole. Yep. It's more fun with him. Yeah, no, I agree. So, so real quick, boss, because you we talked about, you know, your great love, affinity for, and respect for the Dodgers back in the day. And you were talking about a player coming in and being a prima donna versus being a clubhouse guy. And I'm reminded of the story of the year that Kurt Gibson joined the Dodgers. And in, in spring ball down in Florida or wherever they were, they probably, probably went all the way to Florida from L.A. But anyway. Vero Beach. They put, somebody put some eye black on the brim of his new Dodgers cap, and he put his cap on. And when he took it off, he had that black halo around his forehead, you know. And, and, um, and it was a memorable moment for some of the folks that were there because, you know, Gibby was a former football player and was a, a bulldog of a guy, and he went nuts. And he said, I'm not here to be your friend. I don't need you making jokes at my expense. I came here because you guys suck. And the reason I'm here is to make you winners. That's because you guys couldn't do it on your own. Now, you want to play baseball with me, or do you want to be a bunch of clowns? And that's the year that he hit the home run in the World Series, I believe, right? I may be romanticizing it. But, you know, the one where he's running around the bases giving it the, yeah, yeah, you know. And I wonder about that dynamic. When I watch the Astros... I see, and I saw it in in Justin Verlander's face, a joy return to Verlander, a childlike enthusiasm for the game appeared on his face again when he got out of New York. It was obvious to both Ash and me that this guy was home and he was happy. And I did tell Ash earlier, although Verlander's most dominant years were clearly in Detroit, I thought that if the Astros could have won the World Series this year, that Verlander might go into the hall as an Astro. I think he'll go into the hall as a Detroit Tiger, and I respect that. But there's a chemistry among these Astros that reminds me of the years that I enjoyed watching the San Antonio Spurs with Duncan and Ginobili and people from different cultures, different countries, but a unified front to try to win ball games that was not businesslike, it was family-like. The Astros seem to be a family Whereas a lot of these other teams, I think these guys... Assemblage of pieces and, yes, sir. and, and you know, a kit car, so to speak. Who don't talk in the offseason, don't hang out in the offseason. Like, I picture you, and I remember you saying to Craig Biggio and, and Jeff Bagwell, hey, now that we're all in the same club, I guess we'll be hanging out together a lot more. And I'm just picturing, like, you and Craig and, and Baggy hanging out in your orange jackets, watching a ball game, eating some nachos. You know, it's a family deal, right? Well, you know, you... you it's certainly true. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example of what you're talking about. Uh, two weeks ago on a Saturday, I go out to uh, our grandson's soccer game, and uh, you know, we're finished with the game, and I look over, and who's out there? It's Craig Biggio's That's out That's awesome. <laughs> and uh, he's out there watching uh, a friend. Of, you know, he's a, uh, his wife is the godmother to one of the kids that are playing. And so we had the, the – a conversation we talked there for about 15 minutes and it was like you know with those type of guys you can go you can say things you know you know that, that they aren't going to go any further than that right and that's what you're talking about with your family you can get caught up you know in uh, in five minutes and uh, it, we, it was just this, you know we're uh, just a just a blessing to be around each other. It's and, like uh, visiting with us on Wade and Carter you can say whatever you want nobody's listening. <laughs> Steve Kidder <laughs> says, Steve Kidder goes, hey, Brent, try Terry's patience again. That was fun <laughs> about Vizio. But John Paul Hull says, and this sums up our listenership, he says, so awesome to hear insight from a pro player and coach like Terry Poole. He's a great dude. Jonathan Williams then throws out the tough question. Why does Terry think that the Astros struggled so bad at Minute Maid, both in 2019 and now yeah. in 23? Only yeah, two times in history. Great, great question. And that's the one thing that, uh, somebody has to be held accountable for that. You know, that's a that's a manager, uh, that's a general manager, and that's a player. Uh, somebody has to be. You know, there's got to be some sort of change made somewheres. You you can't. Uh, we losing to people like Kansas City at home. Right. <laughs> like come on. But when and, you're there, and, and I know you go to games, and Dawn and I go to maybe half a dozen a year. The crowd is rowdy. The crowd is in, and it's a packed house. The Astros have got to be among the top four or five teams in attendance. And it's always a pro Astros crowd. And they're I always mean, wearing yeah. Astros gear. The Astros lead oh, yeah. the major leagues in merchandise sold. Yeah. 
I, I don't, you know, and, and, you know, and everybody seems to, in general, like and appreciate the ownership group. I don't know what, I don't know what's missing because they do want to please. They do like playing at home. I don't understand what. Yeah. What, what know, do you think? What, where, where's the mental block? What could it be? Did you ever struggle in a certain ballpark? Uh, not to that fashion. You know, <laughs> right. uh, I only but, hit 370 yeah. in Fenway. Yeah. No. I, yeah. But, you know, what's funny is uh, um, with, the, with the Astros, you had three guys in the lineup that were outs, maybe sometimes four. And uh, you you want to know you know a smart manager like a Bruce Bochy he's going to pitch around those key guys to get to his our outs right and uh, he he did it masterfully absolutely he you know uh, um, <laughs> I always got I love Bruce because we, we were together in Double A baseball and he would pick me up and we'd go to the early morning workouts in his blue Chevy Nova. And we would drive a hundred miles an hour to the field, and I would be shaking by the time I got up. I, I love him to death. He hasn't. I listened to all his interviews. He hasn't changed a, a bit with the way he he's you know he kind of pushes out the words. You know his his voice yeah. and everything. Yeah. He just he you know he's, he's just a you can't li- not like that guy. It's he like is, he's. It's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? If you're friends with Terry Poole, you're like one <laughs> one removed. I mean, like, Terry Poole is the guy that can tell you from experience, don't let Dusty Baker lie to you. He laid out of the lineup when J.R. Richard was on the mound. <laughs> don't let him lie to you. I love that. I love that you know these guys. By the way, Coach, you have aged better than Bruce Bochy. Bless his heart, the road has been hard on that man. Oh, I think wow. the, He's got the, the bad hip or something he's from had, that catching, you know, bless his heart. Well, you bet it was. You know, he struggled with his legs back then, and then he had two knee surgeries. You never know, by the way, he walks out to the mound. But, you know, he's a, I think that's part of the reason why he left managing. For yes, a while, sir, he's, the pain. He was so embarrassed to walk out to the to get the pitcher. Well, you know, my, my lovely like, bride, <laughs> my lovely bride in full Astros gear, Donnie, just the other day just goes, look at Bochy. He looks like he's got to go potty. <laughs> I said, man, Don, give the man a break. He's hey, a great guy. You know, you know, one of the beautiful things that I get to do, you know, and I guess you didn't know this yet, but I am the executive director now of the Astros Alumni Association. Oh, we did not and know I've that. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, it's just one more thing that you do for nothing. You know, <laughs> sure. and, uh, and, but you know, it's a love for Astro Baby. But I've had a chance to connect with all the – a lot of old Astros in this off season, I'll be able to connect with a lot more. Uh, one of the guys I got to connect with was Doug Rader. And that was one of the funniest, you know, I get on the phone, I get his phone number. <laughs> and and uh, the first, you know, I introduce myself and he starts laughing. <laughs> he starts laughing <laughs> on the phone. And I says, you know, I told him what we're doing. And, he's, and he says, Terry, he says, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get photos. So we're, we're creating uh I candy on the on the on the Instagram and uh, uh, Facebook, and then we're gonna roll out a, a website here in the next two three weeks. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, he, he says, Harry, you want a picture of me? He says, I'm ready to push push up daisies. <laughs> <laughs> well, he sends me the photo, and it's a photo of him. You know, he's sitting with an old Astro shirt on that he has, <laughs> and and no socks on. He's got bare feet. <laughs> It's just, it's just a, and it's player after player I'm getting to reconnect with, you know, that I, I may have had a casual uh, friendship with. But He uh, was older than you. Raider played before you, yeah. played with Durker. Man is the Rangers I, I, for a while. Yeah. yeah, I told him that I saw him. You know, when I was a minor leaguer, I would walk over to the main field of Coco, and he was the third baseman. He was playing the game. This was a real game that they were playing, well, an exhibition game, spring training. And the guy hit a ball down the road down the third baseline he dove caught the ball in behind and was screaming at the base runner he says forget about it you're out and he threw the ball to first base for an out i saw that and i went that's I awesome going, this guy is nuts speaking of that as a as a manager somebody who appreciates somebody showing up to the ballpark every day have when was the last time you saw a third baseman turning the type of year that alex bregman did this yeah. year 
Yeah, Brady is uh, uh, he he had an incredible defensive year. You know, he had ninety some RBIs. Yeah, he comes to play every day. He, you know, he's he's got that good hard body. He, he plays. Uh, he, he was without guys like him. You know, you, you think you could. You know, sometimes you think, well, Brady, why? How did you miss that pitch? And, he, and I think there was a little bit of a question mark on his power numbers this year in terms of why so many fly balls caught on the warning track. Yeah. Uh, but but without uh, uh, Bregman in that lineup, we don't do the things because he was a he was a steadying force. And you know, also 105 uh, RBIs or 110 RBIs out of uh, Tucker. You know, yeah. <laughs> you got to think about those. You know, 90 I, RBIs out of Abreu. Yeah, You've got up. one more year of Tucker under. I think they paid him five million this year, um, and I think the goal would be to sign him this off season. Say five for 150 as opposed to letting him test free agency next year is that you, you think that's a priority for dana brown to get him signed long term like they did alvarez now well they'll never get him cheaper there you if go that's what you're saying. you'll never get him cheaper now your decision is do you want you know you, you got to make a hard decision and say can you get him out of this funk of course you can get him out oh of, of course you can what is he 27 yeah, yeah. yeah. You you you, ne- you you've never had a better opportunity to sign that guy. You couldn't sign people for who have 110 RBIs uh, uh, in front of their free agent here, right? So like yeah. he, uh, but they have an opportunity here, and if they uh, if they choose to that he wants to be part of the team, this is the time to do it. I can't how about, how about Jeremy Pena? I mean, guy's good defensively, but he hits what 220, 230 yeah. during the year. Is he is he the that guy? Was, that was a I don't know. You know, he defensively he played pretty well. I think uh, offensively, you know, he, I can pull holes in his swing because he, what he does, you know, how he sets up. Yeah. And uh, you know, he, he comes from a very poor setup st- position, so, which means then he has to compensate somewhere to be able to hit a major league pace fastball or any kind of pitch. So I would, I would seriously get him to change that because he has an extra move in his swing. He gets himself unsquare. And then he has to square up his body again, then to launch the bat. So, and you can't do that. I used to do that with players with with Isaac. You can't do that and be ineffective. You, but they feel uncomfortable with it. Well, it's crap, uncomfortable. If it's you know, coming you, at you at 100 you miles an hour, you don't have. To, well, okay, so you, I know what you're saying. He's got the bat laid off, and it's kind of lazy yeah. and laid off, and only Rod yeah. Carew could do that. It's, and it's then he wants to the bring it. Bread. It's not the bat breath. His it's hands. When he does that, he, he moves his shoulders back. So that means he gets unsquare. So if he would keep his shoulders there and do all that stuff, that way his square his shoulders are square to the plate when he comes into the wall. But he, when he does all that laying off, he'll move his – he's swaying back, and then yeah. he sways forward to get square, and that's his problem. So maybe with a different – even a, a different posture, would you like to see him more, yes, more like, a, like a Bregman? More like a brick. Get in there, get I set. Care. I don't. Uh, he he has to change that if he wants to be an effective major league hitter. I'm well, sorry, we need him just, to be. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, because he's got a good body. He runs great. He's got. And yeah. He's, yeah, he's a lovable guy. He's uh, marketable. He's but how do you pinch hit for him with Singleton in the playoffs? Because you didn't have Guriel. Don't, don't don't get me on that one, Ash. <laughs> okay, so I, I won't. <laughs> uh, why why is Singleton on the roster? Period. Nobody else. I it's don't a know. feel good story, yeah. Terry. It's well, a feel okay, good story. Then, okay. You you hit it right on the head. Why isn't there somebody else? Right. What, what's it, you know, why? Uh, and you know where I'm going there. Yes, yeah. sir. You know, it's like, why wasn't that move made? Yeah. Amen. Well, we're out of time. We're sir. out of we time. The it, time though. just flies, <laughs> sir. I, I tell you what, I'm I'm gonna I say it all the time and I want to say it where you can hear it. I just appreciate the conversational candidness, the fact that there's no we, – we, you've never, ever told us. Well, don't ask me about this because I'm part of the Astros family. I don't want to be involved in that. You've always been extremely candid. Um, you're, you're such a joy, and, and, and as to me, don't get me wrong, we're roughly peers in age, but I've always been a huge fan, and um, I just really appreciate the time very much. And Ash is one of the few things I'm jealous of Ash because it's certainly not height or looks – I'm jealous that Ash has had so much opportunity just to sit around and rap baseball with you because it just means the world to me. 
And um, I hope that you have a great week. And we'd love to have you on more often, especially this off season, as we address some of the things and we didn't even get into today. No, but the maybe, upcoming contracts yeah. and stuff. We'd like maybe post World that. Series we can have you back and talk about the, the the lineup and where we go from here. Yes, sir. Yeah, anytime. Man. Hey, God right. bless. Sounds Tell good. your family hi, and we appreciate you very much, sir. Yeah. Thanks, you. Terry. Be well, yeah. folks. That's Astros Hall of Famer Terry Poole, and if you didn't get it, we like him. And what a great guy, and what a what a candid conversation with a, a true fun. superstar. I'll see you all tomorrow. Brent's on his way to Mexico. Bye con Dios, amigos. I've been kicked out of my near every bar around. 